stirring spirit that encourages me to live and seek out my gifts, to extend myself with a generous and hospitable heart, and to strive to engage wholeheartedly in the community and the world, even when uncertainty exists and vulnerability is called forth. I mentioned my friend Jim Calhoun, who is a pastor of 65 plus years. He started as a young thing. <laughs> he has given me lots of inspiration as I reflected on this passage from Matthew. And he reminded me some of some of his own church experiences. He reminded me of C.S. Lewis and how Jesus insisted that the church would be so much more. In fact, Jesus said to the disciples in the Gospel of John, you will do even greater things than me. So we have experienced the church in its greatness. Many of us have also known the failures and foibles and flaws of the church. As Apostle Paul states to the Corinthians, we are but clay, and thus the church is a clay vessel. She is an earthen container that holds the heavenly treasure. Robert McPhee Brown said that the church is a little bit like Noah's Ark. If it weren't for the storm outside, we couldn't stand the stench inside. <laughs> Hopefully that's not true. I did shower this morning. But <laughs> despite our sour socks, maybe the stink eye that we get from across the room, or even a leaky roof, none of that can keep me away from the many times that someone, something has called me back. I will build my church, and I believe him. God keeps his word. C.S. Lewis wrote a magnificent little book called The Screw Tape Letters. Is anyone familiar with that the novel by C.S. Lewis? The Screw Tape Letters is a novel that, that um, there's a that describes um, the underlings of the devil. <laughs> uh, the undersecretaries of uh, the devil in hell called Scrutate, and he's giving advice to his nephew, Wormwood, who has been given the assignment to win the soul of a man for the father down below. Wormwood expects a stern discipline when he has to admit to his uncle that he has allowed his charge to join the church. To his nephew's surprise, Uncle Scrutate exclaims, well, this might be the best thing that has happened yet. Joining the church, the best thing yet? Yes, keep his attention on the little things. The usher with the squeaky shoes. The soprano who sings off key. The lady with the funny hat and the old hypocrite across the aisle. If you do that, you've got it. But never once let him catch sight of the church. Triumphant, as mighty as an army with banners flying, marching across time and eternity. If he catches sight of that, we've lost him. Have you seen this vision? I have. That's the church Jesus promised to build. And that's the church that will increasingly confront hunger and war and racism and injustice, ministering to the hurting and the last and the least and the lonely and the lost of us. That church is the agent of the kingdom of God on earth and Jesus said not probably not possibly not maybe someday but I will build my church next week we'll look at the church and the unlikely materials that form this body of Christ those unlikely materials include me and you and so many of our ancestors who were both faithful and fallible people but somehow, these very pieces were woven together, are woven together, continue to be woven together with Christ in order to change the world, to make a lasting impression. So today, it's worth considering how the church even began, and who would claim such an audacious statement as, I will build my church. What kind of credentials? Did the one have to, who claimed this? Did he have any power, prestige, wealth, influence? Did he have a family name to go off of? Did 
Did he have degrees in engineering or architecture? Was he an expert in construction? As far as we know, the only thing he ever made was an ox yoke and maybe some household furniture. Did he fulfill the Old Testament image of Messiah that might give him <coughs> some right to make the bodacious claim, I will build the church? Isaiah predicted that he would be despised and a rejected man. A man of sorrow and, anti and, um, and acquainted with grief. From one vantage point, he seemed to be just a man, an ordinary man, lacking any qualification to make him able to claim that he would build a church in time and eternity. Just an ordinary man. His ordinariness may have been the first impression to the Galilean re region, but his solitary <coughs> life poised him to the unique and extraordinary in all the ways that matter, thus leaving a lasting impression. Peter recognized that in our text this morning, you are the Christ, Jesus. You are the Son of the living God. You are the essence of what God is incarnate in human form. You reveal to us and enable us to experience the very nature and character of God. You are the best picture that God has ever taken. <coughs> In his essence exists a mutual vulnerability with the Trinity and all of creation. Jesus Christ is ever pouring out love to God and the Holy Spirit, only to be filled again. I like using the image of a water wheel. This came from Richard Rohr where the water wheel has buckets that fill up with water, right? But have to be emptied out again to be filled again. And that is the image of the Trinity. That's the image of the vulnerability that Jesus lives into. He is filled up with love and grace and pours it out so that he might be filled again. He embodies this. And from that eternal an abundant source of grace and love, Jesus can give to creation, embody humility and vulnerability as a human, and understand the force that exists through relationships and reconciliation. Relationship becomes the way toward a most perfect reality of reconciliation, making all things <coughs> whole and one with God. Paul exclaimed, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and giving unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus said to Peter and to us, wherever people make such a confession, my church is being built because faith such as that is the stuff out of which I can build. The line in Paul's letter that Lisa read for us this morning struck me <coughs> For God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts, so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. It's a bold, meaty statement that expresses a full message about who God is, who we are, what gifts we're bestowed with, and the purpose for that gift. God is the one who entrusts us enough with the gift of light. The gift of life and understanding that we, the beloved beings, even as earthen vessels, can acknowledge and experience wonder, the beautiful, mysterious, and empowering reality of the holy by knowing the unique man named Jesus. And this impression not the first, not the last, but eternal impression is more than characteristics. It is, Jesus is, a way of life. Such a man, a unique man, can say, I will build my church. Such a man, a vulnerable man, can say, 
I will build my church, an earthen vessel holding heavenly treasure. Such a man, an incarnate man, can say, I will build my church, a body of in interconnected humans with all of their gifts and foibles. Such a man, a relational man, can say, I will build my church an expression of the very essence as we partner together. Such a man, a purpose-filled man, can say, I will build my church, a fulcrum upon which we change the world, making all of creation whole and reconciled to itself and the holy. Such a man, an everlasting impression is the one we remember today and celebrate as we live together in the sacrament of Holy Communion. So as we know and as we reflect on this unique man, I invite you to consider who he is in your life. How is Jesus calling you into the world to partner with him? to be vulnerable, to be in relationship? <coughs> what impression has Jesus made on you and the church? I'll invite you to reflect on that as Mac and I sing together.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. It is right to give thank you. That's your line. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and good and a great and joyful thing always and everywhere. When we give thanks to the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, he formed us in the holy image, breathed into us the breath of life, and we turned away and we failed. Our love, but his love, remains steadfast. O oh God, you delivered us from captivity, you made covenant with your sovereign God, and you spoke to us through the prophets. And so, with your people on earth, all the church, all the company of heaven as well, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God in power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, the recovering of sight of the blind, and to set liberty to those who are oppressed, to announce the time that was come. It is to save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners, and then by baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth <coughs> to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us a new covenant by water and spirit. And so, on that night, Jesus gathered his friends around. He told them already, I will build my church, and I need you. And you need me. And so as you go as to be the church in the world, remember who I was. He took the bread. He gave thanks to God. He gave thanks to God. He broke it. And he offered it to his friends and to all the world and said, This is my body, broken for you. Every time you take of this, remember me. He then took the cup, the cup of the new covenant, the cup of a new covenant that was about love and grace and mercy, and he shared it with all of his disciples and all the world and said, this is my blood shed for you. Every time you drink of this, remember me. Let us say with confidence one more time the Lord's Prayer. Our Father. 